Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Beliefs and Values Year 10 Lessons uh, for Pre-Small High School. Um, this is the first of the online lessons that we're going to be looking at, so uh, you've got the opportunity to use this video to help you as we go through uh, the topic. And um, we're going to begin with looking at who make who makes decisions in the UK. And um, we're going to start by thinking about what uh, democracy is. Uh, that's going to be our first topic. Uh, a few points on this just before we get going. Hello everybody. Hi, how are you? Uh, um, what I, I want to say uh, is a few things. One, uh, this lesson will be available for you to uh, watch. Obviously, you're watching it now, but we will have it on file for you. The other thing is if you go into our virtual learning environment, you will be able to check uh, in the lessons at home section year 10 and you will find all the resources for any of the lessons that you need you'll find the powerpoints there everything ready to go uh, to help you along with your learning um, at home uh, so one thing I will say as well is when we come to tasks I will take the time uh, to stop and I'll pause for about five or six seconds and just wait uh, if you pause the video once the task is set, then complete the task. Um, and when you've completed the task, unpause it and I'll be waiting. Woo! <laughs> Yay! But I'm not just going to leave the video just sat here. Okay. Dum -de -dum -de -dum. Lovely weather. Turned out nice again, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> hopefully uh, you will find these lessons helpful and enjoyable. Um, so here we go. Right, so what are we actually looking at? We're asking the question, what is democracy? And in order to ask what is democracy, uh, we're gonna hopefully all be able to explain how people get their say in our world and in our society. And also be able to give a definition of what democracy is, what the word means, and actually what the principle of democratic society really means. So most of you will also be able to explain some of the uh, advantages and the disadvantages of different forms of democracy. We will look at two in particular. We will look at direct and indirect democracy. And some of you will also be able to evaluate different forms of democratic representation uh, within the UK system of democracy. So how it works with all the nuts and bolts. All right. First thing I would like you to do, I want you to have a little think about some decisions that I am going to put up for you. Now, with these decisions, I want you to have a little think uh, about if you are able to <coughs> decide these <coughs> with your friends, with your family, or with groups of people, and how that actually works. How can you make these decisions? So, there's a list of decisions. How do you decide what you are going to watch on Netflix or Prime or on television? Uh, how do you decide what you're going to eat for dinner? I mean, let's face it, some people like foods that other people don't. And what subjects do you want to study at post-16 education? How would you decide that? Um, where do you go on holiday? Who decides that? How do you decide it? How do you come to that decision? And what you wear at school? Uh, so I'd like you just to take a few minutes just with a notepad or some paper to write down your thoughts about that. I'm going to go silent for about five seconds, pause the video, crack on with the task, and when you come back, I'll be here. Okay, welcome back. Uh, making decisions, hmm. Making decisions isn't always uh, an easy thing. Uh, it's all right if the decisions that you make only affect you. If they affect you, that's great, no problem at all. But the reality of the situation is that a lot of the decisions we make not only affect us, but they affect other people uh, around us. Um, you know, so you've got to have a, a consideration of other people's views and opinions and other people's views and opinions don't always agree with yours. So I'd like you to take a few minutes just to write a table, quick table, two columns if you like on a piece of paper, you could do it that simple, uh, and list some individual decisions. 
things that you can decide for yourself and should decide for yourself and some things that are shared decisions some things that you have to consider in consultation uh, with other people and you have to bear in mind their different views and opinions the examples I've given you for here um, what career I choose well you know this is going to be the rest of your working life of course that should be a decision uh, that you know it should be an individual decision you you may consult other people you may ask for independent advice and guidance uh, we have Miss Slack in school who is wonderful at helping with that guidance a lot of people will be very supportive in giving you the best advice they can um, but it is you know your decision on do what you love um, and deciding what you want to do as a career um, when you are an adult deciding what family you have well, that could be a decision, obviously, that's influenced both by you and your partner. Um, so naturally, it's a, a shared decision. And it's one of those, I guess, negotiations that people have uh, in relationships when they are getting to understand where each other is on an issue. OK, uh, take a few moments. I will wait here patiently uh, while you go and complete that table. Really, I'd like to see four or five options in each of those columns. Um, you could be enthusiastic, and that would be great, uh, and maybe include six or seven. Uh, and you could be a complete beliefs and values ninja uh, and go for nine or ten options. Give it a go, and I'll be here. Okay, making shared decisions is a challenge. Yeah. Um, it really is. You know, how do we make decisions when perhaps we have one view about something and somebody else has a completely different perspective on it? People sometimes have a different opinions on the choices that we make. Sometimes we agree and sometimes uh, we disagree. And it's not a bad thing necessarily to have disagreements sometimes actually when people have different views on a matter uh, it gives you the option to get really creative excuse me i just pulled my mic out um but i'm gonna keep going yay uh, it gives you you know a, a creativity they may actually sort of say well you know i kind of disagree with you and here's my reasons why and you might change your opinion or they might say, well, you know, I, I kind of agree with you, but what about doing this as well? So the discussion that comes from disagreement can often be a very creative, innovative thing. And it also means that as many people receive the good, receive the benefit from your decisions as possible. Now, we have to find ways to make decisions that seem fair to all parties. That doesn't mean that everybody gets their way but it's seen as a fair decision, that everybody's views have been heard and a decision has come, been drawn and somebody has come to a conclusion or some people have come to a conclusion. Um, you know, imagine this scenario. If you've got a group of 20 people, yeah, who want to go out after lockdown is lifted. All that time in the house, you know, thinking, yay, we can go out and we're going to get together with our mates because we're now allowed to. Right? And they have different ideas where they're going to go and what they're going to do there. So if you imagine that scenario, how are people going to decide? How, how could people make a decision that seems fair and reasonable um, and which the group could respect, even if they don't agree with the choice that's there? Let's assume that people have lots of different ideas. So... Inevitably, some people are not going to get their way, but how can they still feel that the decision was fair? I'd like you to explain why you think it's fair as well. Um, uh, try uh, and do this in full sentences, of course. Uh, please make sure you fully develop your explanations. You might want to uh, give some examples uh, that will help support your arguments too. Uh, in the meantime, I'm gonna pause while you complete that. Um, and I shall be here as soon as you unpause the button. Please pause now. Okay, so we can get back underway. Brilliant. Right, in the United Kingdom, 
we have a population of ouch, 67 million people. 67 million people live on our little island. 67 million. That is a huge number in a small space. So how on earth do you get 67 million people to agree on anything? And the reality is most of the time you probably can't. So how do you get to make a decision that represents 67 million people's views and still have that decision seen as fair? Well, the way we do that in terms of running the country is to have democracy. The UK is a dem democratic country. It is a democracy. But what does that mean? What actually is a democracy? I'd like to take maybe a couple of minutes just to come up with your own definition of a democracy. So pause the video now, and when you're done, come back to me. Okay, hopefully you've done that. Um, we'll move on. Well, according to a dictionary, a democracy is the belief in freedom and equality between people. All people are free, all people are equal. Every single person, regardless of race, age, color, creed, faith, gender, disabilities, sexual preference, anything, right, we are all equal. So, a belief in the freedom and equality between people, or the belief in a system of government that is based on people's freedoms and, free, and people's equality. In other words, we all have the right to speak. We all have the right for our views to be heard, but those views have to be balanced as well, equally with the 67 million other people in our country. The belief in freedom and equality between people or a system of government based on this belief in which power is held either by elected representatives or directly by the people themselves. Now that's a really interesting point. We are a country in which power is held by elected representatives. Well, how that all works out well, in order to really understand how we use democracy, we need to understand what democracy actually is and where it came from. In fifteen, sorry, in five o seven BC in Athens, uh, yeah, here we go. Let's pronounce some Greek for us, shall we? Uh, Cleisthenes, uh, I think it is Cleisthenes, um, was the leader of Athens. Athens was a city-state, so it ran almost like a country, even though it was a city. And he introduced a system of political reforms that he called Democratia. And that allowed rule by the people. The word Democratia literally is broken down into two Greek words. Demos, which is the people, and Kratos, which is power. So this city-state I think it certainly was one of the very earliest models of democracy, if not the first model of democracy in the world. So how did that work? When they started all this out, how did they make sure that decisions could be made but that people's views were represented? Well, they broke it into three separate institutions. Now in later lessons, when we look at the UK and some of the institutions we have here, you may see some similarities. They broke into three areas. Ecclesia, Dicasteria, and Bull. Now, I'm not sure how your Greek is, so I might actually help you out at this point uh, and give you <laughs> a little bit of chance rather than having to translate something. Let's sort of give you a bit of a fighting chance uh, to uh, understanding those terms. Ecclesia. So, Ecclesia. Ooh. Ecclesia. Well, this is the sovereign governing body that wrote laws and dictated foreign policy. If you have a think about that in terms of our modern society in the UK, we would be talking about the government 
and Parliament. We would be talking about whichever party was in rule and the ministers who had responsibility for different areas to make decisions. We would be thinking about the Prime Minister. Uh, we would be thinking about uh, the opposition who challenge the views and opinions of the government. We'd be thinking about the House of Commons and the House of Lords, Lords who both write laws and check laws. In fact, we'd even be thinking about the role of the monarch, the king or the queen, in actually approving laws or rejecting laws. So that was their early principle. You had this high governing body who oversaw uh, state matters of state and foreign policy. Then you had uh, the need for me to move up a little bit there and as if by magic. Ooh. <laughs> I'm having way too much fun with this. Um, here we have the Council of Representatives or the Bull. Right? There were 10 different Athenian tribes and within these 10 tribes they chose a representative from each group and these 10 formed together into a group, a committee if you like, called the Bull and they would check what the uh, Ecclesia had done uh, and they would confirm or deny uh, or block what was happening with that. But that was an opportunity not just for national decisions but to be made but for decisions affecting regional areas and local tribes. Um, rather like our local government if you like, uh, our regional assemblies, uh, our local authorities or maybe the metropolitan mayors, the city mayors um, that we see quite a bit of um, more recently. And uh, the Casteria, these were public courts. Uh, these were places of discussion and debate. And the way this worked was people uh, uh, would go there and citizens would argue cases in front of a group of jurors who were chosen at random lots before the sessions. So you'd have, um, say you had a, a hundred people turn up at stuff uh, and you would pick say 10, 12, 15 people who would be jurors and they would be picked at random and they would sit there and they would decide whether they were convinced by the argument and they would take it to the ecclesia and to the ball to uh, come up with a decision um, or whether they were not. But this was a place where people could raise their views, air their views and anybody who was a citizen, which unfortunately meant anyone who was male and not a slave, um, was born in Athens, so it was quite restricted. But hey, these were early days in democracy. But it gave citizens the chance to have their views heard and to put forward their arguments. The Athenians loved a good argument. So you might actually see the similarities between our democratic system and the Athenian democratic system. Uh, now, that worked for about 200 years, okay? But that worked in one city for about 200 years. How do you get this system from a city in ancient times to work for a nation of 67 million people in the UK today. How on earth is that achievable? Well, let's have a think. Our democratic system in the UK allows for both important ways for people to get represented in decision making in our country. Uh, don't forget the Dicasteria allowed direct access with citizens being chosen as jurors and making a decision, almost like our UK legal system, perhaps, almost like our local councils, perhaps. Uh, but it also had a system whereby representatives were chosen to speak on behalf of that group of people or that particular tribe you had direct democracy, uh, decisions where an individual gets to give their opinion or make a decision, and you had indirect democracy, which is where a representative of a large group of people speaks and decides on that group's behalf. Now, I want you to have a little think and pause for a moment 
and write down some ideas of how we get to directly give our views in the UK and also how are we indirectly represented in the UK. Take a bit of time to think about it, write it down. If you can come up with those examples, that would be absolutely fabulous. I'm going to go quiet if you pause the video and I'm here when you restart. Okay, welcome back. Hopefully that went smoothly for you. Direct and indirect democracy. Hopefully you've got some of these written down. Um, firstly, direct democracy. Elections. We directly, each and every one of us, get to make decisions. We get to make decisions on who represents us uh, within Parliament. So, one person, one vote, and within the local area, we go and vote and we make a decision on who is going to stand up for our views and our opinions. We also get to directly choose and make decisions in a referendum. The classic example for this was Brexit. A referendum was released looking at whether we should stay in the European Union or whether we should leave the European Union. Um, what was really interesting with this was the predictions were there would be a narrow margin to say that we should stay in the European Union. What actually happened, and it caused chaos to be honest, because I don't think many people were prepared for that to be the actual outcome of this referendum. We decided to leave by a very narrow major uh, majority. It was 50.8% voted for it, 49.2% voted against it. Now actually a lot of people also chose not to vote, but for those who did vote, and in democracy decisions are made by those who turn up, those who did vote made a statement to the government with their votes saying, we want this nation to leave, or we want this nation to stay as part of the European Union. The majority decided to leave, and Brexit became a reality. Um, we also have indirect. So our MPs go to Parliament and they discuss key issues for our nation, uh, but they also represent the local community's views as well. Each MP stands in an area or a constituency for about 70 odd thousand people. There are about 650 MPs. And they stand and they will argue local issues and points of view and they will raise how it's going to affect their local area when the country is making a national decision. And when it comes down to it, they vote. Now this isn't a vote where all of us can participate. That MP casts one vote as the representative for their constituency or for their area. So the MP I voted for, or didn't vote for, but got a majority in my area, uh, has a representative vote for everyone in that area. Um, if they listen to their local people, uh, they are more likely to get elected again. But they can decide to vote against what their constituencies feel. They might do that because they belong to a political party and their party says, we would like you to vote this way. There are actually uh, members of parliament who hold a job called WIP. Uh, now a whip is someone who will go around and talk to the people in their party and say with this issue that's coming up we would like you to vote a certain way we would like you to vote yes or we would like you to vote no on this issue and if you go well, I don't agree with you on this they'll have a discussion with you and they'll try and explain to you why you should do that they might even encourage you with a little bit of pressure you know but they are there uh, to discuss it and try and get the whole party voting in the same way. But the MP can choose whether he votes with his party or whether he votes to represent what his constituents say. Uh, it's their choice. We have passed on our representation to them. The other way is uh, governments are uh, chosen from the members of parliament that we elect and they in the government appoint ministers with responsibilities in key areas, for instance, education, health, um, transport, foreign affairs, 
the Home Office deals with UK security and UK issues, all these different areas where you've got people making day-to-day -day decisions. Now they are being held accountable within Parliament. They have to go and answer questions and they have to make statements about things and the opposition keeps a very close eye on them. In fact, the opposition will appoint shadow ministers. So there is a shadow education secretary who will keep an eye and challenge the education secretary and sometimes will go yeah I agree with what you're doing sometimes they go hold on a second I think this is wrong I think we need to raise this as an issue and they will ask questions in Parliament and make sure that people know that they disagree with those views but those views you know are made and those decisions are made by people who are elected by us but then go on to make decisions they feel are in the best interests of the country. Now I've put at the top there, contact your MP. Now the reason I've kind of put it in between, the MP, you know, has your representative vote and in many ways is indirect. Uh, but on the other hand, your MP, if he wants to get elected again, really should listen to the views of the people in his constituency. Let me just summarise that for you. So members of parliament represent about 70,000 people or constituents in their constituency. The government, usually made up of the largest party of MPs, sometimes shared if there's a coalition and they have the responsibility for making day-to-day -day running decisions. Voters are asked to make a decision on a specific issue by voting about it. And voters are also asked to decide who will represent them indirectly when you vote for your member of parliament. Contacting MPs, it's direct because you're raising your personal views and it's indirect because the MP can choose how they will vote on what questions they will ask. They may choose to ask the question or raise the issue that you've discussed. They may choose to vote in a way that you agree with. They could also choose to vote in a way that you disagree with. Okay, moving on. I would like you to have a look think I'd like you to draw this table. Uh, I want you to look at five key areas. Voting, referendums, uh, contact with the MP, uh, MPs voting in Parliament, and the government acting on things. And I want you to think about the advantages of the way that system works. So write down some positives about the fact that we have governments and ministers making decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. But what are some of the negatives as well? You might want to include some examples in this table. I reckon you should probably give about 10 minutes to this task, uh, but make sure that you do it in detail. If it takes a little bit longer, fair enough. Um, I will wait here uh, while you go off and eagerly complete that task. Again, try and include as much detail as you possibly can. Pause the video here. I'll see you in a moment. Okay, let's move on. Right. Here are some interesting questions for you. I want you to have a little thing. Now this is about your opinion, okay? I want you to have a little think and tell me what you feel. Now you may feel that actually, um, that our di direct democracy in the UK is really effective. That being able to talk to our MPs is great. Uh, being able to, um, hold referenda on key issues that are really important to the whole country but we get to have our say you may think that's fabulous you may think we're very effective at that you may feel that we need more direct representation so I would like you please to draw a line and mark somewhere on that line where you feel where your opinion is please explain your reasons why you have put yourself there think about it you know, very few decisions in life are black and white yes or no so there may be strong strengths with our direct democracy, there may be weaknesses with it. I want you to give that consideration. Then I want you to do the same thing with our indirect democracy and think about how well we are represented by our MPs, by Parliament in terms of the House of Commons and the House of Lords, uh, by uh, the government, okay, the leading party, and also by people like the Prime Minister and Ministers of State who have responsibility for different jobs. Uh, give yourself a little bit of time for this. I do want you to try and write this in as much detail as possible. Point, evidence, explain. Get that detail in there. Try and link it back into the question as well. So give yourself a little bit of time, uh, pause the video, and I'll be here when you're ready.
and we'll get moving on again. Okay, so really just to conclude, a reminder of what we're looking at. Hopefully you'll be able to explain what democracy is, uh, you'll be able to define the term democracy, you'll be able to explain what indirect and direct democracy are, and some of you uh, hopefully will also be able to evaluate how well they work, to what extent do these forms of democracy benefit us? Are they effective or do we need to improve them? Have a little think about that. Um, I also want to just really give you a chance to maybe do a bit of advanced work and have a little think slightly further ahead. So I've set um, an extension task. This is uh, for most able students within the subject, uh, but also uh, if you just feel this is something that really interests you, give it a go. It's always worth a try. I mean, what have you got to lose? At the end of the day, you could discover something new. You could find out something interesting. You could grow your knowledge, and that's a really important thing. You know, learning is what we're all about. So give that a go, have a little think about, about it, and I will look forward to seeing you in the next lesson. Have a great time, and thank you for watching. Keep safe, keep well, and do things you love. Do things you really enjoy. Make sure that you make time for learning, but also make time for your family, and make time for yourself. Have a great day.